You know, it really is uncanny how these two games overlap. <laughs> Welcome to the 200th episode of Game Theory. I mean, technically it's the 201st and a half episode because we had a mini theory way, way back on the channel a long time ago that's now privated because of reasons. And then technically the Bendy episode last week was the 200th episode, but I thought this felt more appropriate because it's solving FNAF with one final mega theory. So the 200th episode of Game Theory. Proud members of the Pink Guy Truthers Club. Now, for those of you who don't know, one of the longest held debates in FNAF theory dumb is whether this murderer watching children die is the same as this murderer watching children die. Because of their different colors, they became dubbed purple guy and pink guy, the two most threatening colors. Taste the rainbow, slaughter the rainbow. Anyway, since FNAF 2, I have been opposed to this theory and I can now confirm it is dead. Like a child wanting a mediocre slice of overpriced pizza dead. Ding dong, the witch is dead. One look at Scott's new strategy guide for the series, The Freddy Files, confirms it. Page 48 when describing the Foxy Go 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 minigame from FNAF 2, quote, Purple guy is visible in the lower left corner of the room. There it is, clear as crystal. Purple guy in the corner. Now comes the super awkward question that I never thought I'd have to answer. Which purple guy? Cause there's two now, and if you didn't know that, strap in, it is gonna be a long episode. FNAF as a franchise has always been defined by questions. What was the missing children's incident? Who is purple guy? What's the deal with Balloon Boy? Seriously, what is the deal with Balloon Boy? But by FNAF 4, the games had just become a mire of unanswered questions where it was becoming harder and harder to tell the difference between a withered Freddy, a phantom Freddy, and a Nightmare Freddy, let alone a Golden Freddy versus a Golden Fred Bear. We had Fazbear Frights, Fazbear Pizzas, Fazbear Entertainment, Fred Bear Diners, Fred Bear and Friends, Missing Children, Crying Children, and Bites from pretty much every decade. Then came Sister Location, where between the Butter and Bongos, theorists, myself included, struggled to try and fit together a story told by animatronics that lie, hand units that lie, animatronics that fuse with other animatronics, and animatronics that fuse together with humans, who then become purple and immortal. Needless to say, it was a Lot. For me, what had become the scariest part of FNAF wasn't the jump scares, it was the lore. So you can understand why when the novels came out and offered what seemed to be simpler solutions, I hopped aboard. I started looking for more streamlined solutions within their pages, hunting for clues to the games in a place where they didn't exist, but kind of looked like they exist and probably should have existed but didn't exist, and the only thing I accomplished in the process was making things more complicated. So in all the time that FNAF 6 has been percolating in the back of Scott's mind brain, I've thrown out everything that I thought I knew about this series, and I've gone back to doing what I do best. Darn it. Basic counting. One Freddy button, two Freddy buttons, one foxy toe, two foxy toes. Only this time, I was aided by knowledge of where the series was headed, as well as Scott's latest release, The Freddy Files. It's a book that many others dismissed as merely an elongated strategy guide to the games, but to me, it was invaluable at filtering down years worth of lore into the details that Scott himself deemed as the most important to focus on. And this entire process of starting at square one has helped me to see connections I never made before, enabling me to create the thing I was most scared of a timeline. A series of events that explain key breadcrumbs that Scott has left for us along the way. And the more I looked, the more it all started to make sense. And that's the plan for this video, and spoiler alert, the next video, to create a final definitive lore-based theory on the insanity that is FNAF. Putting to rest the key lingering questions in the first five entries of this franchise and opening the door for Scott to usher in FNAF 6. Since at this point we all know he's just waiting for us to solve the previous games before he releases the new one, right? Come to think of it, maybe I shouldn't finish this theory. Now, while I could sit here and rattle off hexadecimal color codes and animatronic design features to painfully hammer out the timeline inch by inch, no one cares. Trust me, I know, I wrote two other versions of this script where I did exactly that, and both of them sucked. I was boring and confusing myself. It gets way too convoluted way too quickly when you dive into the details. But when I took a step back, I realized that the best way to understand FNAF at this point in history is to know that it's not a story about a haunted pizzeria, it's the story of a family. 
Meet the Aftons, a perfectly normal family of five. Father, daughter, son, older brother, and mother. And the secrets of the Fazbear timeline are actually buried in the fates of each one of these characters. We begin with William Afton, the original purple guy, the father, the one who starts this whole timeline with a story that's all too familiar to us by this point. He starts killing kids at bear-themed pizza restaurants. It starts back in the 70s. Should have given him a big purple afro there, Scott. FNAF 2 flashes us back to these origins showing us Purple Guy's first victim at Fred Bear's family diner, before flashing forward to show another five victims of the Purple Guy in the FNAF 2 location, and potentially yet another five victims in the FNAF 1 location. And he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for those meddling kids. Literally, because his victims refuse to stay dead. The soul of the first child enters the puppet, who then gives life to the other children by preserving their spirits in the bodies of the other Fazbear animatronics. Give gifts, give life. We've all known this for years and Scott even confirmed it, but we had to start somewhere since this is where the story begins. But where the story heads to next might surprise you. Sister Location. More specifically, the mini-games from Sister Location, where we meet Afton's adorable green-eyed daughter, no name. Doesn't help that none of these characters have a name. You see, old Billy Afton isn't content with manually killing kids anymore. He's busy figuring out new ways to mass murder the youth of this nation, and he does what any good business owner ought to do, outsources it to the machines. He designs a series of fun time animatronics with features specifically made for luring and capturing kids. We can see it on their blueprints. Parental tracking, grouping, deter and misdirect, parental voice sync, and once again, he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for those meddling kids. Or kid, in this case. His own daughter, in fact, who is so excited by the circus baby animatronic that she ignores her father's warnings to stay away from it and falls victim to the claw. In true FNAF fashion, she done gets herself scooped, goes on to possess Circus Baby, and that causes the eye color of Baby to shift from blue to green. The tragedy results in the spin-off restaurant Circus Baby's Pizza World closing down in one day. The day it opens, and the fun times get stored, as the trailers say, deep below ground where memories sleep, just waiting for the day that they become rentals, one Afton down. Now before we kill off the next Afton child, let's rewind a minute to explain why Afton's daughter getting turned into human Froyo goes here. Since this is a pretty extreme break from how most people understand the FNAF timeline, evidence the first, not only do we see the animatronics actively moving around their respective galleries, but their luring and capturing features were built with the specific intention of them acting as free roaming robots, something that we know was phased out in the aftermath of the bite of 87. We also know that this incident happens before spring lock suits get decommissioned. On night four of Sister Location, Baby traps you inside a springlock suit and says this. You're inside something that came from my old pizzeria. I don't think it was ever used. At least not the way it was meant to be used. So Circus Baby and her pizzeria were from a time before the unfortunate incident at the Sister Location involving multiple and simultaneous spring lock failures, which prompted all spring locks to be banned, aka the Bite of 83. More on that whole thing in a minute. But perhaps the biggest clues to the timeline placement of the baby incident come from FNAF 4, what most of us have considered the first game in the timeline where the crying child gets bitten at his birthday party while psychic friend Fredbear, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Psychic friend Fred Bear promises to put him back together. Throughout the game, the crying child, Afton's youngest son, keeps hearing the words, remember what you saw, repeated over and over to him. When the game first came out, the best I could do was speculate about what this was referring to, but now I think we have our answer. This moment. His sister getting scooped. The crying child saw this happen, thus prompting his fear of animatronics. And we know he saw it through one crucial design detail that Scott included. Look at how this kid's nightmares of Fred Bear materialize. The stomach mouth. It's a design detail that we all overlooked, but there it is, positioned in the exact same way that Baby rips in half to claw grip Afton's daughter. It's how a child would perceive that incident. And that's not all. It also explains why the Afton home has an empty girl's room in it. Something that Scott clearly thought was important for us to see, so why is it empty? Because the sister is gone. She's dead. She's a victim of William's sloppy kidnapping scheme. Just to be clear, I know a previous theory said this girl was Baby, but she's not. It was a predictive theory based on visual similarities that didn't pan out. In sister locations, Scott very clearly showed us that Afton's daughter doesn't wear her hair in pigtails and has a different color of hair than the pigtail girl in FNAF 4. And we all know how picky Scott is about colors. At least at this point in the series. He learned his lesson after the whole pink guy thing. That's not all. Ballora also gives us an interesting perspective as we move on to the next member of the Afton clan. Here's a big question that no one's thought to ask about this series yet. The mother. 
Mrs. Afton, where is she? I mean, don't get me wrong, adoption is a great thing, but something tells me that Slick Willie over here isn't the single father of three type. It was a question that I had never considered until the answer practically slapped me in the face while I was reading the Freddy Files. On page 127, Scott draws a very clear contrast between Funtime Freddy's voice system and the one belonging to Baby and Ballora. Quote, Funtime Freddy's audio seems pre-recorded and relates to kids and birthday parties, unlike Ballora and Circus Baby's audio, which is more complex." End quote. It's an interesting detail for Scott to specifically call out that I honestly never considered. Ballora is much more aware of her surroundings, responding in real time to movement in her chamber and not seeming to rely on pre-recorded lines like the more rudimentary animatronics. I can hear it seems like more than just a coincidence that the only other robot possessing this level of speech ability is the one that we know has Afton's daughter inside of her. Up until now, we've all been quick to write off Ballora as just this weird Rule 34 bizarre new addition to the animatronic roster, but is it possible that she has a bigger part in this story than we all realized? This is far from speculation. Another major clue hides in the song that she sings, one that Scott draws particular attention to in her character profile in Freddy Files. The lyrics go, Why do you hide inside your walls when there is music in my halls all i see is an empty room no more joy an empty tune it's so good to sing all day to dance to spin to fly away this reference to an empty tomb devoid of joy resembling a vacant tomb is the same sort of language you would hear from a parent who had just lost a child, with the child's bedroom acting as a sort of tomb reminding them of their loss. Could it be that this song is referencing the daughter's empty room that we just talked about from FNAF 4? And if that's the case, does that make Ballora's true identity... Mrs. Afton. Ballora is motherly in a way that all the other animatronics aren't, with the mini Renas as her children. And she's a much older and more mature looking robot than anything, anything that we've seen throughout the series. If this were truly the case, based on her song, it sounds like after the daughter done got herself scooped, William retreated into his work and probably a fair bit of child murder, hiding in his private room to bury his grief. That's what Ballora's line, hiding inside your walls, is referencing. It would also explain why William has abandoned his other two sons by the year 1983, the time we see FNAF 4 roll around. He's too grief-stricken, leaving the older brother to be the one to have to take care of the crying child. Somewhere before 1983, his wife leaves him, or dies, or something, it's not really that important, and Afton preserves her memory inside the animatronic Ballora. And with that, another Afton gets buried in the basement. Which brings us to 1983 and leaves the men of the household as the last one standing. Crying child, older brother Michael, and the fate of William. One gets bit, one gets scooped, and one gets... sprung? Ugh, I don't know, that sounds kind of bad. Regardless, the debate of whether Michael or William is the true purple guy who ends up in Springtrap is part of next week's video, along with how we know that this is 1983 and my definitive answer on who the crying child becomes. So make sure you ring the subscription bell down below to find out next week as soon as part two of this ultimate FNAF theory airs. Seriously, do it. Otherwise, you'll never know how this series ends and you'll forever be wondering whether it's Will Trap or Mike Trap. And then FNAF F6 will come out and everything will be all higgledy-piggledy. And as a final treat for those of you who want to get super nerdy about the series and need more clarity on these early controversial timeline placements, well... <gasps> If you look beyond just their fancier, more modern design, the evidence around the sister location animatronics points to them being earlier models. One detail of FNAF 4 that I've been kicking around in my head for a year now is the canonicity of the Halloween update. In the update, Scott included three new characters, Nightmare Mangled, Nightmare Balloon Boy, and Night Marionette. The appearances of Mangle and Marionette were both labeled as non-canon to the series, but things hit a wrinkle with Nightmare Balloon Boy because he got a pass. He was deemed canon, and that set off huge red flags for me because it tells us a crucial detail. That by the time of FNAF 4, Mangle doesn't exist yet and Crying Child hasn't seen the puppet, but Balloon Boy does exist and has been seen by little Jimmy Night Terrors over here. Logically, for Scott to officially say that 
Nightmare Balloon Boy is canon, he has to have predated the events we see in FNAF 4. Balloon Boy had to be around prior to 1983, which leads us to what we see and hear in Sister Location. Sister Location's location is full of humanoid robots. Sure, there's Balor and Baby, but there's also these little dolls that share a similar shape and visual style to Balloon Boy, making it seem like an earlier pizzeria had a more human theme than the Fazbear restaurants. That restaurant, I believe, was Circus Baby's Pizza World. Now, one thing I know people are gonna bring up. In Sister Location, Hand Unit says, Due to the massive success, and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender at children's entertainment. Hearing the location of Sister Location opened after Fazbear Pizza closed down would lead you to assume that the events of Sister Location are happening later in the timeline, and you wouldn't be wrong, they are. But, Hand Unit is talking about Circus Baby's entertainment and rentals. Baby and Ballora were built for Circus Baby's Pizza World, which, as I showed, came out long before that. This coincides with what we learned about Circus Baby's Pizza World in the pregame teaser Scott released on Scott Games. Quote, The grand opening of Circus Baby's Pizza World has apparently been cancelled due to reported gas leaks in the building. There was only a handful of people that ever got to look inside, kids from here and there. End quote. Obviously, this is all a cover-up for them actually closing the restaurant in the wake of Afton's daughter's death. That's beside the point. What's important here is that the animatronics were built at an earlier time, clearly during a period when Rosie Cheeks got a big thumbs up in the design department and were then stored underground after opening day when Afton's girl got scooped. Some were kept in rotation, rented out for parties, which explains how Balloon Boy shows up in FNAF 2, while all the others got forgotten underground, only to be uncovered when Michael was sent to put them all back together. Wait, are you all still here? Oh good, because I have yet to say it. Remember, it's all just a theory. A GAME THEORY! See you next week for the finale to my final FNAF theory. Well, at least final FNAF lore theory. I suppose I could do a science one if the mood struck. And if there is eventually news for FNAF 6, I could do a predictive theory about it, I guess. By the way, did you hit that bell yet? You should to celebrate our 200th episode, give or take one and a half or so. But whatever, this one feels like a big event. And finally, you remember my YouTube Red series Game Lab? Another episode is free for you to watch right now. No YouTube Red subscription required. Available internationally. No problems. Just click on it and watch. And it is, lo and behold, the FNAF episode. I put myself as well as three other YouTubers through a real-life version of the FNAF series. 100% recreated too, like battery-powered doors and everything with limited energy, it's great. Check out how I do in a real-life version of FNAF by clicking the box to the right. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to I need to go record part two of this episode so that way you have it ready in time for next week. Not letting you down, not making you wait a questionable amount of time for the finale to this whole thing. We got this. It's gonna be a good one.